Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. We hope you're encouraged by the message. For more in-depth content and answers to questions submitted during the sermon, check out our podcast called Postscript. You can find it on iTunes or on our website at faithbridge.org forward slash podcast. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Duffy Robbins. I want to welcome you to FaithBridge and uh, Happy New Year. We're, we're delighted that you're here to to begin this uh, new year with us. Uh, I, I want to start off this morning with a little bit of a question. Um, I, I want to know if you've ever had uh, one of those moments of, of, of sort of discovery where you, uh, you made this discovery in your life or maybe about your life that just changed everything. That just changed everything. And I'm, I'm talking about epic epic change. Like I'm not talking about the first time you went on Facebook, you know, uh, or, or the first time you bought something online and thought, holy cow, this was the easiest 300 bucks I've ever spent, you know, or, 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 or the first time you ate bacon. Uh, you know, I, I'm, 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 uh, we've all had those little discoveries like that. I'm talking about the, the kind of big stuff, big stuff that changes everything. Maybe for you, that discovery was, was good, uh, maybe for some of us that discovery was bad. Maybe that discovery uh, came through a simple sentence spoken um, by your doctor or, or, or by your boss or, or by your, or your spouse or by your parents. Maybe it was a, um, a moment of self-discovery. Maybe it was a discovery you made uh, about, about uh, someone else. I remember when uh, uh, Pastor Ken discovered that I was his real father. Oh, that's not true. But uh, no, that's not true. <laughs> I'm talking about, uh, I'm talking about those moments when we awaken to a whole new way. I wish I hadn't said that. But uh, <laughs> a whole new way of thinking about, like when the Velveteen Rabbit discovered he was real, right? Or, or, uh, or, or maybe when, when, when Dorothy uh, realized, oh, okay, we are not, we are not in Kansas anymore. Um, or, or how about that, uh, that amazing moment when Lucy walked through the wardrobe for the first time in the Chronicles of Narnia and she discovered this world that, that most people know nothing about and yet it's a world more real and more substantial than the world most people do consider real. Last week here at Faith Bridge, we, we began talking about a a grand story, a, a sweeping narrative uh, that, that spans the entire Bible from cover to cover. It begins uh, in a garden in the book of Genesis and it ends in a heavenly city in the book of Revelation. It's a story uh, told sometimes through history, sometimes through a prophetic writing, sometimes through poetry, sometimes through, through pastoral uh, letters, but, but it's the same grand story from beginning all the way to the end, a story so big, so huge, so all-encompassing that if that we will embrace it and allow ourselves to be embraced by it, um, it, it, it impacts the way we see every other story, including our own. Because we said this last week, that, that the story you believe, the story you believe is the story you live. God's story is, is, is one of those stories that changes everything. It's one of those stories that changes everything. If you have a Bible this morning, I want to invite you to turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. We're going to continue our study of this grand story. By the way, if you don't have a Bible, if you're just visiting, uh, or if you just want to have one to hold and read, uh, just raise your hand. These good folks will be happy to uh, uh, give you one as a gift. Uh, And then uh, in in the spirit of this uh, post-holiday Christmas season, uh, after the service, you can return the gift. Uh, just, just leave it back there on the rack. But uh, if you'd like to follow along, we want to make sure that you have a Bible to do so. Um, again, uh, as with last week, we're going to kind of jump around uh, a good bit in the text so that we can get a little bit more, uh, a better sense of the overall landscape. So I want to encourage you, come back uh, to these texts this week and, and read them for yourself. Uh, take some time to walk the ground a little more carefully. But for the sake of time this morning, we're going to kind of fast forward a bit uh, through a few different passages. We'll post them on the screen so you'll be able to read along. But, uh, but, but if you'd like to follow along uh, in the scripture, I'm going to begin reading in Genesis chapter 3 right there in verse 1. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? 
And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and the man and the wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And the man said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. We said, that, um, we said last week that, that we can trace in God's story uh, the, the same narrative arc that we see in, in many of the stories that we know and love. Um, by the way, somebody mentioned this last week uh, on the way out. They said, uh, they said, we know, we know, I mentioned The Princess Bride. They said, we know why you like the movie, The Princess Bride. They said, it's because you look like one of the main characters. <laughs> and I thought, Wesley, uh, yeah, yeah, I hadn't thought about it. But no, but uh, so I was curious though. I, you know, I go, well, I wonder who they're talking. So I looked it up online. And, uh, and, uh, and then when I started to kind of look at the, the images side by side, I just said, uh, no, nah. you know, uh, it just <laughs> inconceivable. But, uh, but, but what we said last week, when we trace God's grand story, this cosmic drama through the pages of scripture, we will see four broad chapters. We talked last week about chapter one, the creation chapter. That, that beginning in Genesis chapter one, scripture tells us a story that begins with God, a God who is eternal, who is wise, powerful, thoughtful, a, a God who draws near, a God who brings all creation into being, and he calls it good. He calls it good. And, and that's a vitally important starting place because, because that means that God's story is a story that celebrates life. God's story is a story that celebrates life. I think this is one of the biggest misconceptions that we have about God's story is that, is that God's intentions is somehow kind of be the great uh, cosmic uh, killjoy in the sky. You know, that, that God's plan is to somehow shrink down all of life into this puny little box of restrictions. So did you notice this, in fact, in the text, in the passage we've just read, it was the serpent, it was the serpent who was trying to make evil what God called good. Look, look, look back at, uh, at verse one. Notice what this text says. It was, it was the serpent who suggested God's command was that Adam and Eve not eat from any of the trees in the garden. Eve had to correct him. She said, no, no, actually, it was just the fruit of that one tree we were forbidden to eat. But do you, you see that sort of subtle portrayal of, of, of God as sort of the cosmic mean, meanie, the, 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 the cosmic party pooper? This is still one of the tempter's biggest uh, lies. And, and a lot of us, like Eve, even though we, we should know better, we often swallow it, don't we? Hook, line, and, and sinker. We need to remember, God spent six days creating what he described as goodness before he ever spoke the very first word of thou shalt notness. His God's story is a story that celebrates life. It's a story that, that, that celebrates art and, and, and music and beauty and family and good food and, and, and water slides and, 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 and butterflies and, and, and yes, sexuality. Uh, it, because if we know the right story, see, we know that all of that stuff can point us back to the creator and to his mark of goodness. I don't know if you remember, I told you a while back about this Sunday school teacher I had it was about eighth grade. He was a good guy, and I know, he, I know he meant well, but I can still remember him looking sternly into the face of us kids there and, and, uh, 
and the furrowed brow. And, and I remember him just gravely saying to us, you know, young people, young people, sex is dirty. So save it for the one you love. Well, you know, that, that never really connected with us, you know. <laughs> that, that's not the story scripture tells. The Bible tells us explicitly that, that God made male and female and said, this is good. This, this is very good. Like God's going, this is going to work. This is going to work. And that, that's one of the reasons why I, I think I get a little uncomfortable sometimes when, when, when I hear someone say, well, if you're a Christian, you should only listen to Christian music. Or you should only uh, go see Christian movies or, or read Christian books or hire contractors that you find in the Christian yellow pages. You know, it, it, it's, it, it's like saying we should only admire Christian flowers or, 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 or hike on, on, on Christian mountain trails, you know, or, or only sit in chairs that are made by Christian chair makers, right? Or, or that if you're a Christian plumber, you should only unplug church toilets. Uh, you know, holy water. Uh, the, 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 what the scripture wants us to understand that if we know the right story, all of it points back to the creator. And it is a story of goodness. It's a story of goodness, which is what makes this story. We've read this morning in Genesis chapter three, a story of cosmic tragedy. Because for the first time, in the history of the world, someone, first a serpent, and then a man and a woman, begin to question God's version of the story. If you go back and look at that faithful question, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, the serpent says, did God actually say? Did God actually say? So, I mean, think about that. The, the whole momentum, the whole momentum of Genesis chapter one is, is God said, and it was. Now here in Genesis chapter three, the, the, the focus has changed to did God say, and, and will it really be, right? The focus of the story is no longer on the creator who said, let there be. The focus is now is on the created who say, in essence, leave us be, leave us alone. Let us make our own choices. What we're seeing here, being introduced into God's story in Genesis chapter three is what the Bible calls sin. Now, I know for, for a lot of us who come here every week, this is one of those terms that we kind of learn. This is kind of Christianity 101. For some of us, it's one of those terms that we don't fully understand. I grew up in church and I really never had a sense about the, the gravity um, the, the, the problem of sin. I, 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 I heard the term, but I never knew what it meant. I, I remember um, as a kid, you know, like the, we, my buddies would be sitting up in the balcony and the preacher would kind of look at us and say, you kids are sinners, you know? And we didn't know what he was talking about. We're kind of going, oh, thanks. You know, <laughs> we do what we can. I mean, we didn't even know a negative, right? I came home and said, mom, the preacher said I'm a sinner. She said, you are a sinner. I said, mom, look at me. I'm too short to play sinner. Well, I didn't have a clue what they were talking about, you know. I think sometimes that's, that's part of it. We don't understand the gravity of the problem. Sin is when the characters of the story mutiny against the author of the story. You know, when I'm speaking at, uh, at youth retreats, I'll, I'll sometimes explain to students that the best way to understand sin is to simply spell out the word sin, S-I-N, and then circle the center letter I, because I is at the heart of sin problem. That's the center of the problem. I want to live my life the way I want to live it. I want to tell my own story as I wish instead of living into the grand story and saying to God, as you will, as you will. Paul tells us in Romans chapter one, that sin is, is denying the truth about God. Sin is suppressing the truth about God. It's, it's questioning God's version of the story. In Romans chapter one, verse 18, Paul writes, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world 
in the things that have been made. We talked about this last week, that first chapter, the creation chapter. Paul says, then they are without excuse for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Their foolish hearts were darkened. This, men and women, brings us into the darkness chapter of the story. This is the chapter of the fall. It's a, it's a chapter that takes all that is good and, and twist it and, and pervert it until it is distorted into all that is bad. And, 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 and everything wrong about this planet, uh, every evil deed in history, every injustice, every, every natural disaster, every pain you've ever felt has its root right here in this moment, this chapter, the fall chapter of the story. Whether we're talking about war or, or, or disease or racism or poverty or hunger, everything bad is rooted back in, this, in this, this, this belief that somehow we can make good choices and our futile hearts are darkened. You name it, every evil element in the story begins right here in Genesis chapter three. And for the first time in the story, we start to see a thread that will be woven in and through every other chapter of the story all the way into this room this morning. Genesis chapter three, verses eight and nine, we begin to see a God who seeks and pursues and we see a humanity that fears and hides from that God. A God who seeks and pursues a humanity that fears and hides. Chapter two is the chapter of the fall. But then, into the darkness of the fall chapter, get ready for this, something amazing happens. The story takes a, a, a dramatic turn. Maybe you remember um, hearing these words just, just recently, just in the weeks um, leading up to Christmas. Isaiah chapter nine, beginning in verse two. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone, verse six, for to us a child is born. To us a son is given and the government should be upon his shoulder and his name should be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This men and women is the part of the story when the hero arrives on the scene to save the day. Chapter three is the redemption chapter. This is the redemption chapter. God, the creator, becomes a part of his creation. This is a God who is no longer content to just hover over. This is a God who no longer is content just to breathe into as he does in the, in the creation chapter. This is a God who, who, who no longer wants to call out, where are you, as he does in the fall chapter. This, as John's gospel puts it, is the God who became flesh and lived among us. This, this, is, this is Jesus who describes himself in Luke 19, 10, as the one who came to seek and to save those who are lost. Those who are hiding. The very first words out of the mouth of the angel to announce the birth of Jesus was, fear not, fear not. This changes everything. This changes everything. Think about Aslan, the lion. Remember, remember that, 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 that amazing kind of Christ figure on the move in, in Narnia, uh, a, a land that was forever winter but never Christmas. And now all of a sudden, all of a sudden there are glimpses of spring. New life is kind of coming to be. And there are still dangers in Narnia. There, there are still perils to be sure. And, and lots of evidence remain of, of winter's icy grip. But the rumors are true. Aslan, remember this, Aslan is on the move. Aslan is on the move, and we say this very same big thaw. As we read through the gospel accounts of Jesus, we see, we see uh, sick people who are getting healed. We, we see lame people who are able to walk and blind people who begin to see and, and dead people who are raised to life and people whose hearts are gripped in the cold and the ice of sin's embrace begin to thaw with a warm heart of new life. One writer describes this redemption chapter by looking back at World War II, 
when, when, when the Allies made that dramatic D-Day assault on the beaches of Normandy. Sure, it would be 11 more horrible months before Hitler's final surrender on May 8th, 1945. But beginning with those waves of, of brave men storming the beaches in that early morning on June 6th, 1944, the tide of freedom began to sweep across Europe. And what we witness in the redemption chapter is God's story of liberation. This is an assault to push back the forces of darkness. And, and of course, we're not, we're not blind. We, we, we still see, we still sense, I think, most of us, that we're living under the cloud of occupation. Sin is still very much reality. We're, we're sort of living in, a, in an era of now, but not yet. But through Jesus' death, on the cross and his resurrection from the dead, we know that we can now share in a victory that will surely come, that the battle is won. And as Paul puts it in Philippians chapter two, there will come a day when every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And on that day, and on that day, we will all witness the fourth and the final chapter of God's grand story when God creates a new heaven and a new earth. When, as John puts it in the very last chapter of the very last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22, no longer will there be anything accursed but by the throne of God, out of the lamb, the lamb will be in it and his servants will worship him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads and night will be no more. They will need no lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. That's the part of the story we're waiting for. That's, that's, the, that's the awesome part of the story. When, when the bad guys are defeated and, and they're brought to justice, when the machinery of evil is, is, is blown up and sort of launched into outer space, this is when the credits roll on the screen and, read, and they all lived happily ever after. This is literally the Bible tells us that point in the story when, when, when the king, Jesus Christ, kisses his bride, the church, and together they share in a great wedding feast. Wow. Wow. Creation, fall, redemption, restoration, that changes everything. Everything. But what does it change for us? What does it change for you this morning? What does it mean for us here at Faith Bridge as a community of, of believers? How does that story change the way we think about this brand new year, 2015? We can sum it up this morning with two clear certainties. The first is this when we look at God's grand story, we begin to understand that God's story reminds us that God takes brokenness seriously. God takes brokenness seriously. Beyond the fanfare of, of a new year and the balloons and the confetti and the Times Square celebration and the fireworks and the, you know, the meals and the family and the football and the whole deal, the truest fact about this new year to come, just as it was about last year, just as it will be about next year, is that this is gonna be a year of pain and loss and hurt and grief for much of the world's population. Most of us, even in this room, even in this room, will we'll know some disappointment and some sickness and setback and, and discouragement. We, we quoted last week those words from the movie, The Princess Bride, that life is pain, Highness. Anyone who tells you something different is selling something. Maybe you're sitting there, we're going, well, Duffy, thank you for this. This is so uplifting, uh, 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 such an encouragement. Uh, maybe, maybe next you can announce that there's a, a car fire sweeping across the parking lot and, 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 and that an asteroid is heading for our neighborhood. And, 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 and I get it that at first glance, it sounds discouraging, but in a sense, I think this is really, this is really good news because it reminds us that God takes seriously our hurts. 
our disappointments, our pain, the natural disaster, the, the plane crash, the terrorist attack, the mass kidnapping, the random shooting, the needless loss of life, the plight of the widow and the orphan. Part of what I find both frustrating and also very, very encouraging about scripture is that God's story doesn't try to knock the sharp edges off of this pain to make it easier to swallow. In fact, God's story is honest enough to, to tell us right out that, that much of the pain that we, that we experience is due to our own sin and our own brokenness. That's why God hates sin. Scripture is unblinkingly honest when it comes to the problem of evil. This is not, this is not some kind of you know, children's story. This is not you know, you know, the, the gospel according to Pollyanna. Uh, you know, some sort of fairy tale. Uh, you know, Curious George goes to the Garden of Eden. This is real life that God reveals to us. We don't have any easy answers about how a good and gracious God could allow pain and suffering in a world he created. Certainly the fall, Genesis chapter three, points us to a big part of our problem. But there aren't any quick fix platitudes. But the good news is that God's story speaks to the bad news. God's story speaks to the bad. If you're sitting here this morning and, and you're grieving and you're hurting and, and, and you just have this, just this general sense that things aren't the way they're supposed to be, guess what? You're right. You're right. God's story makes that absolutely clear. You know, it, it's, it's, it's funny. One of the biggest hits, one of the biggest songs, 2014, was a Pharrell Williams' song, I'm So Happy. Remember that song, I'm So Happy? Ironically, from the movie, Despicable Me. <laughs> I mean, there, there were times, honestly, in the last year, you could not go anywhere, right, without hearing that song. Happy, happy, you know, and, and it, you start to lose control of your saliva. I, I mean, you know, you did over and over, you hear this song, and, 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 and it's okay, it's all right. Bob Dylan has a song that aligns more nearly with God's story. And frankly, it probably reflects more accurately and more honestly the story that's gonna be played out in real everyday life. It's called Everything's Broken. Broken lines, broken strings, broken threads, broken springs, broken idols, broken heads, people sleeping in broken beds, ain't no use jiving, ain't no use joking. Everything is broken. Broken bottles, broken plates, broken switches, broken gates, broken dishes, broken parts. Streets are filled with broken hearts, broken words, never meant to be spoken. Everything is broken. Seems like every time you stop and turn around, someone else has just hit the ground. Twice in Romans chapter 8, verse 19 and 22, Paul tells us that all creation is groaning with an eager longing, groaning to see this end chapter of restoration. Christianity is not just a bunch of random happy talk. The, the scripture never tells us not to grieve. Scripture tells us not to grieve as those who have no hope. Jesus never promised a pain-free life. What he in fact promised in John chapter 16, verse 33 is this, in the world, you will have tribulation. But he added, take heart, because I've overcome the world. I've overcome the world. If your story in 2015 brings you to chapters of grief, hardship, loss, pain, financial concerns, sickness, marriage problems, concerns about a family member, don't think for one minute that somehow you have fallen off the page of God's story. You have not. Trust in the creator's care. Trust in the creator's wisdom. Trust that there is a bigger story about a God who brings beauty even out of darkness and chaos. And be encouraged that God takes our brokenness seriously because it's not good news if it doesn't speak to the bad news. Which leads us to the second certainty Second, yes, God's story takes our brokenness seriously, but also God's story reminds us that we have a serious hope. 
We have a serious hope. One of my hobbies um, is to collect images of what is often called found art. Uh, found art is, uh, is art sort of made up of objects that have literally just been found, usually um, yard sales, uh, flea markets, sometimes by just, you know, literally dumpster diving. Uh, they just kind of find garbage and, and, and trash. And, 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 and I like it because um, found art invites us to look deeper to sort of look beyond uh, what we first see, to go beyond that first glance, to recognize that even the junky stuff can sometimes tell a profound, um, even, even fascinating story. But I also like found art because it tells a story of redemption and restoration. It tells a story of redemption and restoration. Taking that which was discarded, thrown out as garbage and abandoned, and then literally redeemed, remade into something beautiful. One of my favorite uh, artists who works in this medium is a Frenchman by the name of Bernard Pross. And, and I like his work because it, it, it sort of reminds us that, you know, what, what you see there on the screen, he can take these sort of random pieces of garbage and trash and he invites us to kind of frame them in a new way, to see them in a new way, to look beyond the trash that we do see to witness the beauty that we often miss. It reminds me of what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 when he talks about becoming a new creation in Christ. The old has passed away. Everything is fresh and new. We no longer see as we once did. When I think of this grand story that begins in Genesis and then unfolds through 66 books of the Bible, what is most stunning to me is, is not that God created the world. And don't get me wrong, I, I, I'm, I'm awed by that. I'm often on a regular basis, I, I gaze in wonder and, and praise to God for the natural beauty that, that, uh, that I see on this planet. I, I live in Valley Forge, Chester County, Pennsylvania. This is a place of immense natural beauty. Literally two weeks ago, I was coming back from a doctor's appointment and, and the sunset was so beautiful. It, it literally bathed the landscape with this rich, a deep orange that I, I completely took a different route home so that I could watch it longer and, and see it better. Uh, unfortunately, that, that route also uh, gave me the opportunity to contemplate the lostness of man. Uh, it, it, yeah, my wife wondered that night, why was I calling from Ohio? But, 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 but there's a sense in which, yes, yes, I'm often awed by the beauty of God's creation, but what is most stunning to me is not that God created the world. That's great, but that's not the main thing. And I'm, I'm certainly not, I'm certainly not surprised by anything I read in the chapter of the fall. I mean, I see evidence of that every day. In my life, just like you do on the nightly news, the longer I live, the better I begin to understand the depth and the tragedy of sin, its deceptions, its seductions, its false promises. What keeps me coming back to this grand story, what has captured me, what sustains me in this great story of the world is the great news that God the Father can take this broken world and this broken sinner and somehow through the death on the cross of, of, of God the Son can take all of my garbage and all of my junk and through the work of God the Holy Spirit begins a work of recreation and restoration that makes all things new. And men and women, if that story doesn't amaze you, if that doesn't stun you, then I suspect you might not fully understand the story. That's why Paul writes with such a sense of wonder. In Ephesians chapter two, he says, For I, by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We're his workmanship. 
That's, that's the wonder. And, 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 and the word that Paul uses here for workmanship is the word poema, which is the word from which we get our English word poem. Um, but it can also refer to any other work of art, anything from a song to a painting to, to, to architecture to, to, to sculpture. Uh, F.F. Bruce actually translates the verse, we are God's masterpiece. This, this is basically the Apostle Paul saying that we are, all of us in this room this morning, we are found art. We're found art. We did not find ourselves. We cannot save ourselves but what we can do is yield ourselves to the master who is making our lives into something beautiful. And that means giving to him. Our gifts, our talents, our resources, but it also means giving to him our junk, our stuff, our garbage. Maybe you're here this morning just, uh, just visiting Faith Bridge. Maybe you're trying to kind of check off one of your your New Year's resolutions. I'm gonna go to church more. And I'll grant you, it's a heck of a lot easier than, than giving up dessert uh, for the rest of the year. But, but, but maybe somehow this, 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 this week, this morning, you've heard a story that you didn't expect to hear. It's a story you never knew. Or, or, or maybe you're here this morning at Faith Bridge because you're here every week at Faith Bridge. But this week you've really and truly heard a story you know so well that you've almost ceased to hear it at all. I wanna invite you this morning, whatever is your situation, on this very first Sunday of 2015, to give your heart to this grand story. Because the story you believe is the story you live. And this epic story of creation, fall, redemption, restoration, offers to us this morning two important affirmations that God will take seriously your brokenness and that in the midst of your brokenness, God will offer us a serious hope. In just a moment, we're gonna close our time together. Uh, we'll invite you as we do most Sundays to, to come up here to the front and to pray. We'll have some folks up here from our, our prayer team. We're gonna invite you to come if you'd like someone to pray with you or someone to pray for you, or if you just simply wanna have some time to pray by yourself. <clears throat> Before we invite you to come this morning, I'm gonna close by showing you one other example of, of found art. Uh, this is the work of two English artists. Their names are Tim Noble and Sue Webster. Because what's amazing about their work is they show us how they can take junk and trash and abandon worthless garbage and put it together in such a way that when light shines into the darkness, we begin to see something amazing. My hope, men and women, is that we'll see in these images this morning a vivid reminder of a grand story of what God wants to do with us. The, the, a story that begins with, with darkness and chaos and is transformed by a God who says, let there be light. Because this is not just a great story. It's destined to be our story. This is the story for which we were created. It is your story and my story, and that changes everything. Let's pray. We don't know, Lord, this morning. We don't know the, the trash and the garbage that is uh, piled up in dark places of our hearts. We camouflage it with um, easy smiles, wealth, health, small talk, uh, religiosity. Lord, I pray today that you would shine your light by your Holy Spirit into our hearts and that we would expose our nakedness to you. Yes, it's scary. Yes, we, we, we have this sort of gut reaction to want to hide. But help us, Lord, to expose ourselves to the creator who knows us intimately. So that by shining your light into our darkness, you can make all things beautiful. You are the only master who truly gives us peace. And so, Lord, may we give ourselves to you. 
May we live into this grand story. Thank you. That is ours by grace, by mercy, for your son Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Welcome to Postscript from Faithbridge Church. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the message by sitting down with the teacher of the day. Hi, I'm Lou Ann Riley and I'm Grow Group Director and I'm here with Bible teacher Duffy Robbins who just finished up a two-part series, The Story of the World. Welcome back. Right. Thank you. Good, Good to, be to back see again. you and Happy New Year. Thank you. Yeah, Always glad, fun to come glad back. Glad to have Thank you with. here and uh, the last two weeks you have brought a great overview sort of, of of the Bible and of the story and of the gospel. We talked about four parts, yeah. um, the creation, the fall, uh, redemption and restoration. Yeah looking at all of those. And so um, we have questions that fall into each one of those. We're going to talk a little bit more in okay. depth about each one of those. Yeah. Um, and we're going to start with creation and this paradox question that actually uh, came in that we want to ask about. So in the creation story, in Genesis, we see that God has made, created the earth and everything he says is it's good, it's good, it's good. But then he sees that man is alone and he says, this is not good. Mm -hmm. And so you think about this question, did God make something that's not good? Did he make a mistake? Was that yeah. his intention? Can you speak more <laughs> into that? Did he go that? like, whoops, did you go like, whoops I, 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 that's I not thought really I, what I meant to do. Yeah. Let me now correct that. Now that I'm that. seeing man unescorted <laughs> and un, uh, you know, chaperoned, I cannot let this guy can alone in the garden. <laughs> can you help us with that one? Well, I, I would say, it's a good question, uh, but I, I think it, I, I would Describe it this way, that, that, that when God said it's not good that man should be alone, he created a woman. This was not a correction. It was a completion. It would be like if, uh, if, if you know, you were painting a picture. You, you know, you look and say, that's good, that's good, that's good, that's good. And then you go, oh, you know what, I need one more. That's, that, that's not quite there yet. It's, it's not that it's bad. It's nothing I've done is bad but it's not quite complete until I make this last beautiful brush stroke he called Isha, which is out of man. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and so that's, that, that's kind of how I would describe it. So it's not really a correction, um, it's a completion. Mm -hmm. It's ah, this, this will be the, the master stroke to the creation. And it was women, of course. Yeah, yeah, right, <laughs> right, the mistress stroke. But, yeah. Okay, so um, if we look, we continue to look at you talk, talking about the piece on restoration mm -hmm. um, and how God is continuing to restore and recreate. And, and in this idea of um, restoration, what are we being restored to? What is our, what is the ultimate right, destiny or right. purpose of the restoration? Well, of course, um, Restoration comes from the word restore. So, you know, we're, we're basically trying, God is, is, is re, restoring or rebuilding something that was originally really, really good. And, and so what I think um, this word restoration points us to is what we're supposed to be like. Um, and what we're supposed to be like, Paul says, I believe it's in Romans 6, that we've been predestined to be conformed to the image of God's Son. We're, we're, we're being restored to what full personhood looks like, which is exactly the language Paul uses in Ephesians chapter 4. He says we are to grow into full personhood, into the image of Christ. Um, this also is one of the reasons why Paul refers to Jesus as the second Adam. It's because Jesus is sort of a, a, the, the firstborn of a new race. Mm a new humanity that will someday be fully restored. So just as the original Adam was, this is good, this is a, this is a great thing, but then man fell. Um, now there's a second Adam, Jesus, who did not fall, who did not say, I want it my way. He said, your will, Father, not my own. And that he was sort of the firstborn of a new humanity. Um, that then that's our destiny, to be, a, to be called to that. To continue to move towards to, that. To grow into Christ's likeness. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's essentially uh, our destiny to be formed in the likeness of Christ. That's why Paul says in, Col in Colossians that Christ in you is the hope of glory. Mm -hmm. this, is, this, is, this is where we're headed. And of course, the whole idea behind destiny is it comes from the root word destination. 
This is where we're headed. This is where we're going. It's the end game. And, and Paul says in Philippians 1, 6, and I'm confident that God who began this good work, we'll he'll get you there. That's right. Not by, our, not by our doing, but by his work in us. Awesome. So one of the questions that we um, have included for uh, small groups that you can download here as well. Um, one of the questions is of the four pieces that you talked about mm -hmm. today, creation, fall, redemption, restoration, yeah. which do you feel most people are confused by or don't yeah. understand? So I'm yeah. going to ask you the same question. Which one do you think? Yeah. yeah well, I, you know, um, of course, there are all of them for different reasons. I mean, actually, uh, restoration I don't think people really think about it very much. They really, that's just kind of the forgotten piece. Um, and, uh, and, and, uh, and creation, there's a lot of discussion, you know, the science and religion, you know, do they get along and, 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 and how did creation happen? Um, but I don't think honestly that a lot of that points to, to questions that really impact my life. I mean, they, th th those uh, oftentimes I think people have those discussions uh, more sort of out there. In, in interesting question intellectually, but but you know, but but where I think um, the confusion really does impact our soul is at the fall. Mm. I don't believe we have a real sense of the fall, uh, and I would say that uh, that 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 every Christian and every non-Christian, if I could, if I could say, okay, I have some required reading for every human being on the planet. Um, I would say read Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 18, because this is where Paul sort of sounds the indictment mm. uh, of, of God against humanity, as he puts it, against all uh, unrighteousness and ungodliness. And it's also where he begins to lay out the consequences of sin. Uh, first, that, that it divided us between our Creator. So, you know, Adam hides from you know, God, and he and Eve are afraid of God. But then it also uh, begins to separate us uh, from uh, our other created uh, things. So, so you know, it, it starts to distort and mess up all kinds of other parts of the created order. Um, I think that that is, is really, really misunderstood. Um, and, and then at the very end of that chapter, I think it's verse 31 or 32, Paul says, this is all bad. This is all, these are really serious problems. And he starts to show the, the consequences. It's almost like the genealogy of sin that once you, you know, uh, ungodliness is disbelief in God. That's mm -hmm. breaching commandments one through four. And unrighteousness, excuse me, yeah, unrighteousness is a wrong relationship with God. That's commandments five to ten, uh, our, our relationship with our neighbor. So once you start to do that, Everything just goes to pot. And in, then verse 31 and 32, so then there's one other problem. is that you not only do these things, you seem to approve of those who do them. So what we in our culture consider tolerance mm. is, is one step beyond committing sin. It's then actually saying that that which is sinful is not really sinful. Mm -hmm. That which God calls sinful is not really sinful, which is the original sin and the in the garden. God said, did God really say that? So, so that's where I think the confusion is. Now, the, the, the fruit of our confusion, it plays out in two ways. It plays out, first of all, in our culture at large, we completely misunderstand the gravity of our problem. Uh, I, 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 um, I went to a concert last night while I was here in the Woodlands over at the do, -Si -Do Big Barn. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when I'm here at Faith Bridge, I'll go to a concert. I love live music and and one of the songs is a, was a, a slow ballad about how we are going to make the world better, um, that we just need to love each other. And, and it, was a, it was a nice ballad, but, but empty. I mean, this, is, this has been, you know, thousands and thousands of years. There's zero evidence that we as human beings have that capacity, mm -hmm. that, that what we are more likely to do is, is, is make war. Make a mess of it. Yeah, make mm -hmm. a mess of it. So, so um, I think that's a, that's a really misunderstanding. On the other hand... The misunderstanding on the side of people like myself is that uh, I will forget how seductive and how deceptive sin can be in my own life. That, uh, that I'll, I will miss the sin in my own life in terms of being uh, mean or rude or harsh. Um, that in other words, I'm, I'm really good at spotting sin in and other people. Else. Not very good at, uh, at facing up to it in my own life. And so 
the, the, the deceitfulness of sin is, uh, is so deep and so rooted. David says in Psalm 19, you know, who can discern his ways? Lord, keep me from these hidden errors. And that's, that's a constant prayer. So I think that would be the... And, and if you don't understand the sin problem, then the redemption chapter, you don't need, you it. Don't need it, right? Mm -hmm. Because you don't need to be saved because you don't think you're lost. And so that's why I think chapter two, the redemption, the redemption chapter is important, but it doesn't make sense if you don't understand fully the fall chapter. Great. That's great. That's called TMI, okay. I think. So Long. let me ask you this. We covered a lot of material in a short time. I know it. And I know so it. was there anything that you wish that you'd been able to cover more or anything that you would like to take this opportunity to sort of speak well, into? Well, I wanted more? to talk a little bit about my family and I had an awesome vacation last summer. I wanted to get to that. No, I'm just kidding. But I, <laughs> I think, uh, no, you know what I, I do, I feel like I underplayed, uh, Luann, was that this, this story of restoration that God is telling and writing and, and writing us into is not just something he wants to do in our heart. He wants to do it in our world. That, that what Jesus talked about over and over and over again was the kingdom of God. I didn't even use the phrase the kingdom of God in my message. Um, because that takes another whole, uh, you got to do more explanation mm -hmm. and kind of talk about it. But, but the, in fact, the, this, is, this is bringing all things under his feet. So that, that when I am conscientious about, about the way I... Uh, about creation care, about ecology, when I'm conscientious about uh, injustices that are done, um, you know, that, 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 that is a part of my role. It's not just God saving me. God is working uh, through me to s telling a bigger story that I'm, a, he's inviting me to be a part of this huge story of us uh, helping to save a planet, to, to usher in the kingdom of God. And so, um, I, I didn't get to tell that part of the story, and it's an important, beautiful part of the story that I, that I just, for lack of time, had to leave out. Mm -hmm. Well, you covered a lot, <laughs> and um, I think you have given some great discussion for our grow groups. So Good. thank you for that. Yeah, and I love those grow groups. I think that's a great mm -hmm. idea. Yes. So um, thank you for coming back again. My we look pleasure. forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. And thank you for your questions for Postscript. We will see you back here next week as Pastor Ken kicks off a new series called Breathing Room. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org forward slash postscript.